<laughs> okay, let's, let's make a start. Yeah. You know, it's always a pleasure for me to welcome back a former student who's gone on to achieve all sorts of great things to come and talk to current students. So Ben was with us in 2007, 2008. I was just saying to him, I can still remember him sort of in the orbit of our Crisis States Research Center that was going at that time. Um, and then, you know, he, some of them have already heard that the myth anyway, or the mythology I have around you is that okay. when you deposited your dissertation, you very quickly bought a ticket and flew to Africa. And, okay. And worked there for about 10 years or so. Okay. Before returning to Europe to do uh, your, your PhD based on all the knowledge and also the contacts you had developed in the DRC. So um, Ben's going to talk a little bit about that uh, kind of history. But I, I should say that after he, he, he finished his PhD, he was hired here as an LSC fellow. And so he taught on DV400 for a year. One year. Yeah, because then he very quickly got a permanent academic job elsewhere um, in Bath. Um, his work is extremely interesting. He's really knowledgeable not only about the DRC, but about mining transnational companies and how they, how they interact with local entrepreneurial actors, et cetera, um, which, he, which was a, a main topic inside his, his research work. And he's, you know, his book, has, which he's speaking to tonight, has just been published, and it's an elaboration of his PhD thesis, but you also have a string of articles by now, um, much in demand. And he, he also just heard the other day that he won a, a Leverhulme uh, um, uh, scholarship, uh, fellow, uh, research grant, which is a very prestigious thing to win. So we're really lucky to have him here. Welcome back to the LSE. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, afternoon, everyone. I just learned, am I right, this week 11 for you of your second semester? So I'm very impressed that you're here at five o'clock <laughs> on week 11. So thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, James, for the invitation, of course. Um, yeah, it's always a pleasure to come back to where my journey started, I suppose, in development um, and with development studies. So what will the idea, I think, for this afternoon is that I'm going to talk for just five or 10 minutes about my own journey, I suppose, since I did uh, the course here that you're doing um, back in 2007, which is becoming a worryingly lengthy time ago now, um, every time I look at that. And then we'll open it up. If you have any questions that you want to ask, I mean, I'm sure that many of you are probably preoccupied with the question of what will I be doing in six months, possibly. And so, yeah, we'll then open it up. And I'm very happy to discuss anything either related to what I've said or just related generally, if you have just sort of career development work related questions about working in the development sector and the development industry, and we can talk about that. And then with whatever time left, I'll talk for a certain period of time, but no more than half an hour, that's my promise, about the book. And then we can have some chat and discussion if there's time left afterwards, which there hopefully will be. And then hopefully we can go for a drink um, for those who still have the energy uh, at the end of the session. So that's roughly the plan, I think. Um, so as James said, yeah, so I came and did my, I did my undergraduate in English literature, so completely underrelated. And then I came here in 2007, took DB400, which was, was it being led by yourself? Maybe it was Stuart Corbridge at the time. In any case, it was still called DV400. It was still over two semesters. Um, so it was quite similar to the course you've just taken, I suspect. And then in 2008, so the, the mythology that James has perhaps been telling you about related to me is precisely that. It's part myth, part reality. It wasn't quite the case that I got a plane ticket and flew um, to Kenya, and so, but it was maybe quite close. So after my coming out of the masters in January 2009, and I don't know if you have this at LSE still today, but back when I was here, there was a website for jobs that were being advertised. Like an LSE, it wasn't only jobs for people from LSE, but there was some sort of LSE jobs website. Is that still in place today? I can't remember. Sure. I'm not sure. But um, so there was a position there. There was a professor here at the time who just started an NGO, 
a local NGO in Western Kenya. In a small town in Western Kenya, that was where I lived for a few years uh, in this position. And they, were, they just started an organization and they just received some funding. So it was a small NGO, kind of $100,000 a year. And they were looking for somebody to go out and help with um, sort of the donor side of things, basically. Someone who could help with the financial management, write donor reports, manage donor relations. And that was sort of the position. And so I applied through, through that and got that position as sort of a program support officer and went off. Um, and yeah, it was in a rural town called Bondo in Western Kenya, which is on the shores of Lake Kasumu. Um, and it was a small organization providing educational scholarships, basically primary, secondary, university, vocational to families who otherwise couldn't afford so those fees. Morton Scovedal, yeah. maybe he was assistant professor at the time. He's now a professor in Copenhagen. He works in sort of child rights and child policy. Yeah, um, so he's, yeah, so it's Morton Scovedal. Um, and so that was my first position, and it was actually a wonderful first kind of encounter with, I suppose, if you want to talk about it as a development industry or development sector, it was a very small scale organization doing quite, doing a huge amount really with not, with not huge amounts of resources. Um, there was five or six of us working there. I was, yeah, it was a group of Kenyans and myself. I think I was on about $60 a month. It was a similar sort of income that the others were on. It wasn't, yeah, it was very different to what we often think of when we think of the development industry. That's one of the things I always like to say to my students as well, is when we think of the development industry, it's not this homogenous mass, right? It's very heterogeneous and diverse, and there's many different things you can go off and do within that space. But, and this is where James's perhaps memory does uh, the, the part myth that he was talking about, is my next step after that was the contract ran out, and I hadn't been very proactive or thinking about what would come next. Um, and so I didn't have anything lined up after that contract finished. Um, and so what I decided to do was uh, I took a bus from Kenya down to Burundi. For those, I mean, it, I think it took about two or three days, sort of through Kenya, through into Rwanda, through, Burundi, through Rwanda down into Burundi, because um, I'd had a, a Kenyan friend who I'd met uh, from Western Kenya who was working in Bujumbura in Burundi. And she sort of excited me by coming down and at least visiting. And so I went and visited um, and spent two or three months there just knocking on doors, basically, trying to find some work. And that can often be, if you have sort of, if you're able to get yourself into that kind of a position, it can be a really nice way of looking for an entry level position. Of course, it's not going to be an option available or open to everyone, but the advantage is you sort of cut out, cut out the middle person. You, you know, you're there, you're on location. That already means a lot to an organization if you're physically there. Um, and particularly the smaller organizations tend to have the flexibility to recruit you without going through um, some big central office. So it can be a good way. And so I managed to find an organization um, called Heartland Alliance, which was a, and still is, kind of a small sized, I would say, like um, American NGO, kind of an annual budget of about maybe a million. So, you know, not local small, but also not big, big. Um, and they took me on for a year on sort of um, like an entry level internship position that I ended up staying there for around four years. Um, and we, it was working in Burundi, Rwanda, and, um, and then we moved into Eastern Congo with a new project. And they were working mostly on um, LGBT plus and labor rights issues. So they had a kind of range of programs funded by predominantly by US government and uh, European Union. Uh, and that photo there is, you know, I think we can often have the tendency in the development space, especially when we're teaching, uh, to sort of be a little bit overly focused on the negative, right, or stories, things that don't work and things that went wrong and things that don't pan out. So I put here instead of a photo of a project that I thought was a very successful project and a valuable project, and this community center is still there today, which we opened back in 2011, and it was the first sort of um, community space or safe space for LGBT plus community in Burundi where sort of local activist organizations and groups could also come together um, uh, and organize and mobilize. And yeah, that center is still there getting on for kind of 15 years later now. So I think, yeah, a nice example of when you can get some research funding, in this case from the European Union, and yeah, you can manage to, to achieve, I think, some positive outcomes with that. Um, so that was, yeah, four or five years with that, uh, four years with that organization, Heartland Alliance during which time we got a, some, a new funding for a project in Eastern Congo, which borders Burundi and Rwanda. So I moved to Eastern Congo myself and settled there. 
Um, and then I spent, uh, after that period of time, I moved into, I spent about 18 months working on um, a documentary, which we ended up uh, managing to complete and get out, which was called We Will Win Peace. But it was a documentary project around some of the labor rights programs I've been working on in the mining sector. It's looking at labor rights issues in mining. And there was this whole story at the time around conflict minerals. I'm not sure that resonates so much today as a story. This was around 10 years ago now. Was conflict minerals something that people have heard of? I see some nodding happening. Yeah, so this story around how in the Congo in particular, but not only, um, you know, the exploitation of minerals is like the prime causal driver of the conflict. And it was this campaign to try and put pressure on Apple and Intel and so on to stop sourcing minerals from Eastern Congo and therefore help alleviate conflict. But actually, I mean, the whole campaign had a lot of adverse, harmful impacts on the ground in Eastern Congo. And I happened to be, you know, living there at the time and seeing that. So we decided to make a film because um, I thought it spoke quite nicely to broad issues around development uh, and kind of external interventions and how and why they can often go wrong, right, if they're not well embedded in or understanding the context. Uh, so I, that was, um, and that was really my sideways move into doing, coming back to academia. I mean, this was basically like a mini PhD in some ways. If I'd have known how intensive doing a documentary was before we took it on, I probably never would have done it. Um, but that was really sort of, I, yeah, me moving back to doing this PhD. And then it was, you know, through this experience that, yeah, in 2015, um, still living in the Congo throughout this period of time, but I started my PhD at uh, the International Institute of Social Studies, which is in The Hague in the Netherlands, which is a postgraduate specialist institute, I suppose, in development studies, has around 150 masters and PhD students. Um, and that was to do, and I'm not going to dwell too much on this, because it's based on the talk to you about a bit after our discussion about my book, but looking broadly speaking at political economy of Congo's mining sector, uh, I mean, and I never went into the PhD necessarily thinking I wanted to pursue a career in academia. I just had this story, I suppose, in Congo that I wanted to spend time looking at and trying to understand, and a PhD seemed like a great way to do that. And then it was just through the PhD journey that I just, uh, yeah, I suppose realized that it was a space that I wanted to stay in and felt, com yeah, felt comfortable in and enjoyed. Um, and so it was after that, really, that, um, oh, and that's a photo of yeah, one of the industrial mines where I did a lot of my research, as I'll talk more about. And then in 2019, actually, I moved back, and yeah, as James said, I taught for a year here on the, um, on the DB400 course, and then I moved, I'm now at the University of Bath, and my research broadly is focusing on mining, energy, and labor in the context of green transitions. So I still have a regional focus on Central Africa, especially, but not only Congo, but also thinking more broadly um, in, in the global south and the ways in which green transitions are taking place um, in specific contexts and spaces in the global south that contribute ways that might contribute or perpetuate kind of uneven development outcomes, right, at the kind of global level. And so that's sort of my, uh, my research interest today. So I think that's enough in terms of what I wanted to say. Very, but yeah, I think what we can do now, if I understood things right, James, and is, to, and is to open things up. If anyone has any questions they want to ask, either about this or just about career questions or work questions generally when it comes to the development industry, if you're thinking of going into it, um, happy to have a discussion and uh, try and respond to any burning concerns. Yeah. I would like your take on after having worked in uh, uh, on a GPT plus rights in Central Africa. What is your perspective on in bringing, trying to influence society's understanding of, of this issue as, a, as an outsider? And whereas there yeah. might be so many other critical issues such as maybe basic service provision, one could, should start by looking at what, is, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, I think the most constructive way in my experience to do that is to try and be as much in the background as possible, I suppose, if you're an outsider in that context. So it's, I suppose the role is more facilitative in the sense that in Burundi, for example, you have, you know, an LGBT uh, movement and organizations and, activist networks, right? And the major thing they usually lack uh, is maybe resources, right? whether that's like financial or infrastructural, and, and that's where I think you can come in as an organization and play some sort of a role. But yeah, for sure, it becomes very politically sensitive in that kind of a context if you're seen as being 
yeah, if you put yourself too front and center within that, it can undermine that movement or it can expose that movement and individuals. So yeah, I mean, it's a very sensitive space to be working in. And con like Burundi, for example, in Congo, where um, uh, it's, you know, homosexuality is, is a criminal act, for example, right? So it's a sensitive space. In terms of the second part of your question, where there are other more fundamental, I mean, I don't think necessarily it's a zero sum, it doesn't seem like a zero sum game in that sense where you, you, know, you need to only focus on the most critical issues from a maybe basic needs perspective. Well, of course those issues are all there, but I don't think that should preclude you necessarily from engaging in other issues, fundamental issues around, in this case, human rights, LGBT plus and labor rights that you know, are still have importance right, and meaning. I don't think by doing that you're necessarily undermining um, any work or efforts that are going to be looking at social needs or social services, you know? I don't think it's on either or, I guess, is what I'm saying. You know, I think the two things can still be done concurrently. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a bit more personal question. Yes. Um, so you've been more in the practical side of development, let's say, with the NGOs, and then you went out more on the theoretical side with... Uh, now academia. Personally, in which do you feel like you're, do you have the biggest impact? Impact Because mm. that's the reason that I have now looking for what to do with my life. <laughs> doing an NGO with uh, one community is limited in scope. So where do you think? Yeah. It's yeah, yeah, and it's difficult to answer. I think, yeah, for sure, if you're working for, you know, a local organization, let's say, or you're doing very local community work, then the impact is very tangible and can be very immediate, right? I mean, you're close to it, you're contributing to it directly on a debt, and you're, so you're much, so there is that, I think, more tangible impact and outcome, which I think can be more difficult to measure when you're doing research. Although I'd say, like, you know, a lot of the research isn't just theoretical, right? I mean, lots of... The research done in your department here is, you know, empiric, you know, it's empirical work and it's empirically based, but it's using theory to kind of understand. Um, and I don't think it's a complete binary either. You know, people often in the research world can then also be very involved. Um, if it's not directly working for, say, an NGO, you might be, um, you might be asked by whether it's a, a minister, particular ministry or a particular organisation to, you know, for your, to provide your opinion or your thoughts, or they talk to you and get your. So you can still like inform, I suppose, understanding around a particular issue through a role that you might play when you have some visibility of people wanting to see what you think about, you know, the topic that you're working on or a particular topic related to it. But so the impacts you have in academia and through research, I suppose, are maybe less tangible and less immediate if you're comparing it to community work. But it's, I suppose it's different levels of impact, I suppose, or different ways of impact. But yeah, for sure, like the work I do now, which is more research, well, it is research and research driven, like, you know, I'm not, I don't have that same connection to a particular community project like I did when I was living in Western Kenya, you know? So I suppose it's about what you enjoy fundamentally. You know, I think for me, that was the thing when I worked for the NGO sector, I think it became clear to me that kind of project management and people management and wasn't, just wasn't really something that I necessarily enjoyed or, you know, or, or it was particularly good at. Whereas moving into the research space was just a better space you know, for me. And so I think it's, it's a personal question, but it's also the answer is also like a very personal answer, right? It will, it will vary for everyone here. Um, but if you're thinking through impact, yeah, I think I'll just conclude by saying you can have big impacts in either space, but they're, they're maybe sort of potentially different levels or different ways in which they're being um, happening or, or, or feeling. Yeah. Or maybe first. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, again, this is sorry, again, quite subjective. I'm personally thinking about at the moment going into more of a field work operational role. Yeah. Doing more headquartering kind of bureaucratic stuff. Yeah. And then more order. So I think they're both appealing. And yeah. I mean, I think it's very appealing to actually go like you did and, you know, see, see what you can on the ground. And maybe especially when you're young. Um, but I've heard kind of different things about whether it's better to do operational on the ground stuff first or whether it's mm. better to get that headquarter insight and then you apply it in the most senior position, especially with like localization of jobs now. Um, yeah. Which is great. But um, yeah, so maybe you'll start on what, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, a few things come to mind there. One is that I think when you're starting out, you know, I generally think good advice is that you need to be flexible and have an open mind in the sense that very few people, and this was myself included, are necessarily going to land sort of your dream position and doing, you might have like an exact idea of what you want to do, but it might just be that the labor market takes you in a slightly different direction, but you might find your way to it eventually, yeah? So certainly my advice there would just be, yeah, be flexible and be open-minded because what you do in your first job won't define what you do in, you know, three years' time, five years' time, ten years' time. I think the most important thing when you're starting out is just to get moving. And, I mean, my general sense of the development industry is once you've got, you know, a year or two's experience, once you're sort of you're in in that sense, I think it is still relatively... relatively... Uh, becomes a lot easier to then keep moving and move around within the sector. And once you picked up your first bit of experience, the general, my general impression from people I know and, is that you just keep rolling if you want to. You know, I think there's very few people that I know who picked up a year or two of experience and then can't, can't you know, fall out of the sector, let's say. So, so I just move in. But if, you do, but if you do have the sort of luxury of choosing in terms of what you might do, yeah, I think my inclination would be to say, take the field first. <laughs> Um, for a few reasons, you know, I think one, if you take the HQ position first, I don't mean you here personally, but one might then become comfortable with that and in, in time become more and more reluctant to move away from that. But also you might, I mean, yeah, if you did that for too many years, it might then also be deemed that that is your sort of role and that's what you special, you know. So I think I'd be inclined to say, yeah, to pick up the field experience first. And I think that, you know, there are still a lot of good entry level opportunities for, you know, and I can talk about some of those if you, by the now or later, if people want to hear about them, but you know, there are spaces people can move into, and I think I'd be inclined to go with that as the first choice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I just have a question regarding the documentary that you've done on uh, concrete minerals. minerals. Um, I, yeah, I think it was uh, uh, like part of maybe a bigger campaign, and a lot of media are raising awareness on uh, the problematic aspects of uh, conflict of uh, minerals in the. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about uh, what was the actual impact of that campaign and like did it decrease the demand in the, from the Global North uh, from uh, minerals, from uh, yeah. conflict-ridden areas? And just a follow-up question on that. Um, uh, did it have any sort of, uh, did it make any problematic distortions considering that armed groups, with, will, um, armed groups will always want to find ways to sort of make money and fund their, fund their actions, so maybe, I don't know, some distortions on the ground that you've been able to observe. Yeah, so watch that. I mean, the film will be great for that if you're interested in these questions, because um, it sort of goes, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, did the campaign, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think the impact of the campaign was very much to decrease demand for minerals from Eastern Congo. And there's a whole, there's a long, the short version of that story is that I think for a combination of reputational risk, but also the impossibility of being able to trace where minerals came from at the time, um, major buyers just withdrew. Because there wasn't a global dependence on those minerals from Congo, so they just withdrew from the region rather than trying to prove whether or not they were contributing to conflict. And you know, that, still, that still holds to some extent today. And so what happened, and this is why we made the film really, was the time that I was living there, um, in the first few years, you know, the immediate fallout was, was severe. You know, the economic, I mean, if there was sort of reliable, you know, economic data on at the provincial level in Congo, I'm sure that it would show like, you know, pretty severe recession that took place during that period because uh, the mining sector sort of collapsed and closed down, right? Uh, which meant that hundreds of millions of dollars of cash that was flowing into and through the, you know, local economy in Eastern Congo um, sort of disappeared almost entirely for like a quite a prolonged period of kind of 12 to 24 months. And then your second part of the question, which is what was the impact on the actual conflict given that, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, the, my, I mean, we have other Congo experts here, so I'm, you know, they might, I don't, might see it differently, but I suppose my answer would be, you know, I think that Eastern Congo is a generally a militarized economy. And I think money is being made from any productive activity, whether that's minerals or charcoal or cannabis or timber, timber you know, there are roadblocks where productive activity is, and is being taxed. And so minerals is a part of that story. 
but are any of the armed groups dependent upon minimal revenue for their survival? And I think you see a similar story with, say, the Taliban in Afghanistan, right? They started when the US military went after the Taliban to try and destroy poppy fields with the idea that that would then destroy the Taliban. And we know how that, that ended up. And so I think it's, yeah, I think it's a similarly narrow approach and a narrow way of understanding the conflict in the Congo and understanding the centrality of minerals to that conflict. I think, I think when you listen to kind of conflict experts who talk about the Congo, they generally will say that it was neither about minerals at the beginning, nor is it about minerals fundamentally now, right? It's fundamentally about, I think, well, maybe I won't go into necessarily that, but, um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think you're right in terms of the way you're thinking about your sort of apprehension with that campaign. I think you're sort of on the right lines, yeah, with where you're going with that. But, yeah. Uh, maybe if you're going to talk more about this in the second part, but can you do a real, realistic, real qualitative impact if you're working for an international mining company or not? Um, they're just in a good initiatives and everything is just like worth the year and not, and it's just getting. So, can you have a positive impact in Congo if you're working for a mining company? Yeah. So, you know, so mining companies will generally have, as you're probably aware, like corporate social responsibility departments, or I think now it's increasingly called ESG, maybe. Was it environment? What's ESG stand for? Environment, social, and governance. But it's broadly within this framework of corporate social responsibility. And there's some great books I can recommend where you can read, you know, if you're interested in that, where you can read about kind of really like ethnographic accounts that have gone inside these corporate social responsibility departments and looked at what they can achieve and, you know, how they're constrained, but also what can be done. And so you can get a sense of, I mean, it, you know, it's a tense position to be in. And my, my impression from reading those books is that those corporate social responsibility departments are like continually having to fight and advocate within the firm for, you know, what they might get and what they might be able to do. Nonetheless, you know, you can say that there are, you know, there is funds that are being redistributed both through those mining companies for the CSR work, and then there are, you know, there is some infrastructure that's built, and there is, so, you know, I don't want to say that nothing positive, I think it would be too strong to say nothing, but, you know, there's a broader sort of political economy to it, but, yeah, I think at, like, a local level, there can be some, like, tangible infrastructural, usually infrastructural outcomes. Can I add something? Please do. Yeah. So, no, just... Just because of the alumni kind of angle here, we, there's another one of your predecessors by the name of Jeff Geifel, who works with an organization called Engineers Without Frontiers. And they've, he, you know, he launched, actually after studying industrial policy at DB400, he got the idea. And he launched this campaign to get mining companies, the, the international mining companies, to source locally doesn't really have any illusions that they're driven by the mm. profit making, etc. But that kind of work has changed behavior yeah. for the companies in, in certain places. So yeah. there are interesting things. And you can make it, yeah, for sure. And I think the last thing I'd say on that is that, you, you know, you see in Congo alone huge variation from one company to another in terms of what is being done through their CSR departments. You know, some might not even have one and some. And so to the extent that you see like a variation in outcomes there, it does suggest, you know, that if you, if that is given all the people in that space are able to advocate and push within a particular firm, right, to push that agenda, then it can lead to, you know, more positive outcomes than others. And so, yeah, I don't think it's true to say that it can't be done. But it's just that there's, it's like any industry you're in, there's always tensions and there's always constraints. We're all constrained, whatever industry we're moving in, right, by higher powers and higher motives and higher... But if you're passionate and you're, you're in that space and you advocate and you push for it and you represent a local mining community, you know, I'm sure you can, you can achieve you know, a lot more than somebody who's in that position who is just drifting through it, right? There's money and resources, and if you have the drive and passion to go and do something, I'm sure you could probably achieve something, yeah. Any, any other questions? We, no? Go ahead. Keep moving? Was that a question? No. Yeah? Go on. One more. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, my question is about the, on the line of the others, actually, because I'm thinking as well about what to do. And on one side, um, it's very, I, it's, I would like to go on the ground and do something like working NGOs, because I think that you can really see the realities and mm -hmm. what pattern, I can say. But does it exist sometimes to be, to localize the effect and just, Play in the, in the game that we are like we're studying. We study this game. We study this like this 
system that has, that is very fluid in many cases and does it risk to like do a, an impact that can be can be seen, can seem concrete but at the end doesn't have a, like a longer impact yeah <clears throat> yeah so i think your question is yeah is there a risk through development work development projects of adverse outcomes right yeah i think that risk is always there i think it's inherent to the work I think it's inherent to any movement or organization or effort to achieve some sort of desired, desired positive outcome, right? Whatever that may be, whatever level you're doing that and from whatever positionality. I think that risk is always there basically when you're trying to intervene in, <laughs> in a certain situation, right? To create a certain intended outcome. And yeah, the development industry is certainly no less immune to that than other spaces. It's also though, I think, a very self-reflexive industry you're getting a sense of that already right you're thinking through on this course all of these issues around power and positionality and you know intervention you know so you're thinking through all of these things and you take that take that with you into your work and i think organizations also you know will be doing a lot of reflection themselves internally in terms of what they're doing and what the impact is you know and my sense again i said it at the start about the industry is a very heterogeneous space and so I think there are some organizations, you know, that people would have a view that are doing sort of working in more embedded and more productive ways, right, than others or more. And so I think there are different organizations maybe that have sort of different approaches maybe to the work that they're doing uh, and are more self-reflexive. And maybe Search for Common Ground might be one example that I'd offer of an organization that my impression of them in the Congo is that they were an organization that was quite far ahead of others at the time when I was there, so a decade ago now, and the way that they were working locally and the impacts of their programs. So, yeah, of course the risk is there, right? But that's there with, you know, anyone who wants to engage in anything related to social justice or equity and, right? I mean, any time that you intervene and you never have full control over what, what the outcomes are gonna, gonna be. But I think as long as there's like a degree of being embedded in that context and understanding it and taking that seriously, you know, and working through the right with and through the right people, then, you know, that's kind of the most you can do. Right? But I don't know. It's a tricky, it's a hard question to answer, you know. But it's a risk, but it's not a deterministic outcome, right? It's not that that's always going to be the case. Yeah. No, Otherwise, you won't get out of bed in the morning, right? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so now, what I'll try and do, I'll try and do it in, well, 20 minutes might be tough, but I'll, I'll keep it to 20 to 30 minutes, let's say. I don't want to oversell and then, I always do that to my students when I'm lecturing, I always oversell and then underdeliver. So I'll try, and, I'll try and undersell and overdeliver. So let's say 30 minutes. Um, and so this was the part, yeah, so this is um, Disruptive Development in the Congo, Fragile Foundations of the African Mining Consensus, which basically comes out of that time, I mean, I guess it was around eight years or so living in the Congo. Uh, and this book draws on research that I conducted throughout that eight-year period, as well as some that I conducted more recently in the last few years, but yeah, mostly based around my PhD work. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do in the next sort of half an hour or so is just talk to you about, so what is the African mining consensus? When I'm talking about the African mining consensus here, what do I mean by that? And then rather than going through sort of chapter by chapter what's in the book, I'm just going to give you kind of sort of three vignettes, basically. Three stories from the book that give you a flavor of its content, and then I'll finish up by just giving you a brief outline, like what's the main argument in this book, and what are some of the main implications of that argument, okay? If anything's not clear, if you have a question as I'm going through, please interrupt me. Uh, I have three young children, so I'm used to being interrupted all the time. Uh, so just put your hand up uh, or, or shout out, uh, and I'm very happy to be cut off uh, and clarify anything. Or, of course, at the end, we'll hopefully have time for those of you who are still with us uh, to have a chat about it. So the African mining consensus, I think the first thing to say about it, um, when I use the word consensus, is, you know, it's not a consensus in the sort of, you know, this Gramsci sense of a consensus being hegemonic, right, and operating through consent. You know, it's very much a consensus that operates, as we'll see, through coercion and through violence. Um, but nonetheless, when I use the word consensus here, it's more just to reflect that this is, I think, sort of the dominant way in which, particularly in the world of policy, um, but also um, through certain strands of academic literature, is the way in which 
the mining sector has been sort of conceptualized and understood as a tool to drive um, development. So what's the premise of the mining consensus? The first part is that, and there's a bit of a history to this, but I know that you've all taken DB400, so I'm not gonna spend too much time going into that history. But the first part is the idea that state-owned mining enterprises are basically seen as being corrupt and being mismanaged, right? And should be left out of managing the mining sector. And the second is that local forms of mining, and so here I'm talking about what's often referred to as artisanal and small-scale mining, where you have around anywhere between kind of 10 to 20 million people across the continent engaged in artisanal and small-scale mining, so local African miners, basically. This form of mining is seen as inefficient, unproductive, and a subsistence activity. It's basically not of much interest to a kind of transformative development strategy. And the transnational corporations are modern, complex, efficient, and productive. This is sort of the discursive framing, I suppose, within this consensus. And if you read the literature, you know, you see these words being used um, pretty commonly and frequently in relation to these. If you think of these as three different forms of manage management and ownership for a mining sector, right? Um, and the idea underpinning the mining consensus is that if mining industrialization is led by foreign corporations, then the distribution and use of the value that's being generated can stimulate structural transformation of national economies via linkages that I'll talk a bit more about later and improve local living standards via employment and raised wages. So the idea is basically, uh, and this is a figure from, from my book, the idea is in the top corner there where you've got the red dot, that is capital intensive mining under majority foreign ownership. And that's what the consensus is about, basically. There's some room for negotiation in terms of, you know, is it 100% owned, or is it 70% owned? But it's basically majority foreign owned, and it's at the technological frontier, right? Because then, then it's gonna be, have the maximum level of productivity, and generate the maximum level of value that can be distributed in this way to drive structural transformation, yeah? So that's sort of the idea. So if you have labor intensive at the bottom, capital intensive at the top, and you've got domestic ownership on one side and foreign ownership on the other, you can see where the consensus, I mean, that's what I argue, is where the consensus is. So who are the proponents of this consensus? I mean, some, some of the usual suspects, some of the maybe less usual suspects, but the World Bank and the IMF, African governments and the African Union. I mean, there are some differences and nuances here, but nonetheless, you know, all broadly within this, you know, they're all broadly in this same space. Um, development agencies, um, a range of non-governmental organizations that comes out of the conflict minerals story, which is a kind of an, a bit of a, a side story, um, and various strands of the literature in particular, but not only, and you might have studied global value chains literature or commodity chains. This was a big thing in the early 2010s coming out of the work of uh, Kaplinsky and Mike, Ro uh, Mike Morris in particular, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that, um, but that was a very influential literature in sort of creating this enthusiasm for mining industrialization led by corporations as a driver of structural transformation. So what this has led to uh, across the continent has been the on, over the last few decades, has been the en masse arrival of mining corporations. And I mean, one of the introductory chapters I document, you know, this has taken place through a three-stage historical process from sort of the 1970s, 80s onwards. The first stage was blame the African state for the failure of mining-led industrialization, um, liberalized and privatized the sector, and then criminalized African miners. And today we're talking about this, these local forms of mining. That picture there is of uh, Tenge Fungarume, which is one of the largest copper and cobalt mines in Congo. And I put that picture there because recently there was a, a large uh, military-led operation to secure that mine um, from Congolese miners who are starting to get too close and starting to mine deposits that were deemed to be too strategically valuable to the corporation. So this is where the kind of coercion and violence comes into the story, right? It's about displacing local miners from the most prized deposits and making way for the arrival of corporations justified by this sort of discursive framing or this sort of conceptualization of how economic development happens um, in, uh, in the Congo. 
So the book focuses on, I mean, I use the Congo as the focus of the book, but the Congo is taken as a country that's representative of this broader group of 17 mineral-rich, low-income African countries. I focus on low-income primarily because lots of the mining literature on Africa tends to focus mostly on South Africa, some on Ghana and kind of middle or Botswana, middle, middle higher income countries. But actually, if you look across the continent, most of the mineral rich countries um, are low income, low income economies. And that's a list of them there. And if you look, you can see basically this story that I was just talking about. This is the upshoot in foreign direct investment to this country group. And you can see since the turn of the century, but particularly during the last decade, um, a huge uptick in terms of that annual inward foreign direct investment flows to this group of countries, which now is more dependent as a group of countries on foreign investment as a source of development financing relative to other countries and regions. Yeah. Is there a particular reason for such a explosion in the MDI? Is it because the, there's more demand due to, I don't know. Yeah, so two reasons, I think. Like one would be the commodity boom, which was kind of end of the 90s to the early 2010s. And the other would be the process of liberalizing and privatizing the sector, right? So, these countries all went through different mining sector reform programs financed by World Bank loans, loans that are being paid back, um, to, to basically open up the sector to foreign investment. Yeah. And so but that combined with the commodity boom saw this uptick. And so lots of these countries, Congo doesn't, but lots of the other countries represent more like mining frontiers. So countries that historically didn't have either very large or at all a mining sector, but over the last few decades have developed a mining sector. Like Burkina Faso might be a good example of that, for example. Yeah. Um, so what's the problem with this consensus? What do I think is problematic about it? Is that it ignores, it either ignores or basically dismisses as anachronistic or no longer relevant tensions that are raised by classic critiques of peripheral development. And I'm sure you've touched, I mean, Prebish, I would imagine that you might have been reading and thinking about on DV400 and other courses. I've also listed there some dependency theorists, Furtado and Sunkel. Arthur Lewis is a classical economist uh, from uh, St. Lucia. I'm not going to go into all of those different lines of thinking now because of time. But the point is that when you read this mining consensus literature, these sort of strands or like intellectual lineages are either absent or they're explicitly dismissed as being no longer relevant. So for example, with Prebish, and this was a thing coming out of the global value chains literature, the idea was that Prebish's original critique of mining enclaves, right, that a mining site is sort of isolated or walled off from the surrounding economy, right, and that the value generated just stays in that mine site and goes overseas, the response was, well, that doesn't really hold anymore because the mining industry in the 2000s moved towards this process of corporate outsourcing. So they used to be vertically integrated, they're now horizontally integrated, and they outsource to a whole range of firms who provide all the services and inputs. So the, the argument being made was that, you know, this Prebish enclave thesis is outdated, uh, and we don't need to worry about it. But that's on the few occasions that it is these lines are even acknowledged. For the most part, they're just absent. What I tried to do in the book is summarize kind of the central concerns of these lines of critique as being about, so how and who creates productivity, yeah, in the African periphery in this context? How is the value that is then generated distributed between and within different groups? What use do these groups make of the value that accrues to them? And what are the effects of all of this on processes of social relation and structural transformation. And there was a particular concern and focus in these uh, early critiques on corporate strategies of ownership and control. And so all of this basically gives us reason, or gave me sort of reason in the context of this book, to then ask this question, which I pick up and really is sort of the driving, motivating question behind the book, which is in light of these critiques, which are kind of generally absent from the mining consensus, um, how then does the entry of foreign corporations into pre-existing mining economies interact with and influence structural transformation, accumulation, and labor relations? So trying to understand, you know, given you have these pre-existing local mining economies that are being displaced and moved off the deposits, right, what is the effect of that? And does, you know, does, does the outcome of these processes live up to the expectations as theorized by the mining consensus that it will drive structural transformation? Yeah, is that what we see? 
when we study it. So most of my research that I did, in fact, all of the empirical research, uh, was focused on mining in eastern Congo. Just to give you an idea of where it is there, for those not familiar, you can see that it borders Burundi and Rwanda. Um, and you have North Kivu, South Kivu, and Maniema. So all of the empirical work that I did, or well, actually yes, I did, but the mining projects uh, were in eastern Congo. And this was the focus of the research. In terms of the three vignettes, um, from the kind of the three stories from the book, to give you an idea of the flavor, I mean, in each of these stories is basically trying to probe at the theoretical assumptions behind the consensus. So you see where the consensus has these like theorized outcomes, and these stories are basically just pushing at those and seeing do they hold up to scrutiny when we look at what's happening. So the first is this idea of the superior foreign firm, which you see in the consensus, right? Is that you know, the mining sector should not be owned or managed by state-owned enterprises, domestic firms, local miners. It should be put into the hands of transnational corporations. Um, and when you look into the history of mining in Eastern Congo, it does give us cause to sort of question this idea or assumption that foreign firms lead to superior development outcomes. So the first company I look at um, is Siminki, which, and that's a, a photo of the former social club uh, the headquarters of Siminki in eastern Congo, that I think speaks quite eloquent, eloquently to the broader impact of what's been left behind by that mining company. Um, and when you look into the history, it was a tin miner in the 1970s to the 1990s for around 20 years. And what you see in the history of this firm, so it was operating across the whole expanse of eastern Congo. For 10 years, from 1976 to 85, it went through a period of investment and expansion as the tin price was rising year on year. And so what you see is that the company was investing, it was bringing new mines in, it was expanding, and it was profitable. In 1985, the tin price halved, and by 1997, the firm went into liquidation. I mean, there's a longer story there that's documented in the book, but they basically were unable to control costs in the face of severe price volatility. The tin price didn't recover, they tried to close down mines, they laid off staff, they, you know, they tried what they could, um, and then the firm was liquidated, um, and in its place, Banro came in as a gold miner in the mid-90s and basically took over Siminki's concessions. So Siminki had left the scene, Banro came in, and that's a photo of uh, one of the industrial gold mines run by Banro, and you basically see a very similar story. It's almost the same thing. Of course, there are differences that takes place twice. So Banro in the 2000s, the gold price increased sixfold. That's a huge increase, right, in a decade. That was the commodity boom I was talking about that drove a lot of that investment that we were seeing. Um, and it was a period of investment and expansion for Banro. So they were bringing on new mines, and it was, it was a profitable firm. 2012, the gold price collapsed by a third and again failed to recover. By 2007, Banro had, sorry, 2017, Banro had entered Canadian government creditor protection from which it never recovered and came out. Yeah, and so Banro has since exited stage left uh, about five years ago now. So it's similar stories, right? And they're stories about price volatility, basically. Um, and the way in which price volatility is sort of a structural constraint on the mining sector, it doesn't really matter how the sector is being owned, right? It's not really a story of ownership and management. It's a story of how to deal with price, or the difficulty of dealing with price volatility. Um, in the case of Banro, the decline was hastened by corporate mismanagement and inefficiencies, and I document that in the book. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to keep moving. But alongside this, there was a process of a dual process of enriching the center, so global centers of wealth and power, and impoverishing the periphery, in this case, the Congo. And you see this with Banro very clearly. In the final five years of Banro, as the noose of bankruptcy was very visibly beginning to tighten on the firm, what you see is that senior director compensation increases. Uh, you look at the red lines here. Um, you see that shareholder dividend payments continue. And I argue in the book that this is basically a dynamic of corporate rent-seeking. You know, so rent-seeking is what you often hear about labeled against, for example, African states, right? They're rent-seekers, they're just siphoning off value, they're not reinvesting it in productive activity. That's part of the reasons why we should move away from them to foreign corporations. You see something similar here with Banro, right? It was very evident what was happening, um, but there wasn't much evidence of 
um, trying to tighten and save productive value to reinvest in the firm. Um, and my impression from researching it was there was sort of this understanding that, you know, Banner was going to be run into the ground. The senior directors had already made significant amounts of money off it, and they were going to move on to the next, uh, the next mining firm. At the same time as this was taking place, right, so compensation increasing, dividend payments continuing to shareholders, fiscal payments to the Congolese government were being minimized. This is, you know, this is not a new story. It's a very well-known story. Um, running subsidiaries at a loss um, to avoid paying any profit tax. Debts were being accumulated to the few Congolese suppliers and firms who were involved in Banro's chain. And wages were being squeezed to labor, either through layoffs, canceling annual increases and reducing bonuses. So this dual process in the final five years of Banro, that question of distributional outcomes. Um, the second story is this one that probes that this idea of structural transformation. You know, so mining industrialization is a way to drive structural transformation. I'm sure you're familiar with that term, having studied this course here and what that means. Um, so I'm not going to expand on that and just take that that's understood. Um, but the idea here is that because of corporate outsourcing, so firm mining companies are now outsourcing all these other firms to provide services and inputs, the mining sector today is better placed to drive structural transformation than was the case historically when they did everything themselves. Yeah? And so it is the case that industrial, uh, the corporate outsourcing you know, very much takes place and is practiced um, by mining companies in Congo and elsewhere. But when you, if you take the case of Banro, if you look at its industrial machinery, for example, this is a table of all of its assets by firm and nationality. You see pretty clearly where the industrial machinery is coming from, right? It's coming from North America, Europe, Japan, Australia, and some from South Africa. So there's an economic stimulus here that's being provided to these uh, countries that are providing the assets. Yeah. I know you're short on time, but sorry. Is there, it would be super interesting to know what machinery the artisanal mining sector Oh, is. I'm going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> Do I have 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. Um, Outside of local hired labor, this idea of corporate outsourcing, it was almost exclusively foreign firms who were subcontractors to provide the range of services to the mines. Uh, and what you actually see is that many of these subcontracted firms who entered the Congolese economy through Banro went on to then cement and expand their presence across the country. And there's very, I found very little evidence of procurement or subcontracting stimulating domestic capital formation or structural transformation. Um, and so for me, when you put this all together, this idea that Prebish's original enclave thesis is no longer relevant, you know, I, I would push back against that and say that when you look at a story like this in Eastern Congo, it serves to uh, confirm rather than invalidate this original thesis. This is a quote from um, Osvaldo Sonkol, who was a Latin American dependency theorist, writing about similar dynamics in Latin America's manufacturing sector in the 60s. And reading this, it, always, it, very, you know, it really reminds me and hits home, basically, with how I felt you could describe what was going on in the Congolese mining sector. He wrote, in the 1970s, industry was taken over to a large extent by foreign subsidiaries. Much of the benefit expected from industrialization went abroad. It accelerated growth rates. So, of course, you industrialize mining, you're going to drive high GDP growth rates, right? But at the same time, the uneven nature of development, because where is that productivity that's creating that growth? Where is that going, right? Where is it being distributed? Where is it being re reinvested? Who's capturing it? And I think that speaks quite nicely to the picture that we got from Eastern Congo. So the last story, or the last vignette, gets to your question about um, local African mining. We can talk more about it afterwards as well, because I don't know if I'll cover it fully here, but I do talk about it. This last theoretical assumption, right, or well, this idea behind the mining consensus is that local forms of mining are inefficient and it's a subsistence activity. And this was the justification, basically, for displacing them, forcibly removing them, evicting them from land, enclosing the land for corporations. And this is, I think, a big focus of the book, is to really try and push back against this um, and show a different way of conceptualizing and thinking about and understanding local mining. So to start with, if you look at, the, if you look at take gold as an example, what you see with value creation and distribution in um, the Congolese artisanal and small-scale mining sector 
is that around 95% of the value that's being generated is being retained and distributed domestically in the Congo. So if you look at the lines here, 77, so if a, if a gram of gold is being sold for, let's say, $40, right, if that's the price on the international market, 77% um, of that is going to different groups of Congolese labor, and 18% is going to Congolese traders, yeah? For those asking about conflict minerals, I mean, research suggests, I mean, mine was 0.2%, it's around 0.2 to 1% that will be going to uh, either state or non-state armed groups. So it's a small percentage, but it's high, you know, because they're dealing in the scales high, it's, it's serious money nonetheless. But the point being that a, a huge amount of the value that's being generated is being distributed domestically to different groups of uh, labor and different groups of Congolese traders. Interestingly, and this again departs, I think, from a lot of the kind of Western media coverage of artisanal mining, um, wages to workers in this sector are significantly higher than in the surrounding economy and comparable to industrial mining. I put that as a side note because part of the story of industrial mining is that it will create higher wages because of higher productivity. And this is the Arthur Lewis argument, right? Is that productivity is not set according to, it's, it's basically set according to the informal economy, right? And the product, that's where wages are set. It's not about how productive your firm is, it's about what is the, base, what is the subsistence wage, really, and it's a little bit higher. And you see that clearly when you look at mining. Um, annual, and this is where I think you get into the accumulation dynamic and this question of machinery. The profits being made by the managerial and merchant class in this sector are quite significant. And, and it's, a big, you know, it's a big class in Eastern Congo. We're talking tens of thousands of people um, in gold alone who are making, and you know, this is not just my own data, there's also other people who have looked at this. It's around $20,000 of profit a year um, for what I would call ma the managerial class and anything upwards of 60,000 or more for traders. So there's you know, serious money being made here in a country, for example, where per capita income would be around four or $500, yeah? So it's big, it's big money and this propels this group into sort of the local economic elite in terms of what they're earning. And if you look at what they're doing with that money, a lot of it is being reinvested in other sectors. But there is also, and this gets a bit to your question, I think, and this is what I document in the book, there is a domestic process of mining industrialization basically already taking place, being led by these miners or being led by this managerial class. So the assumption that this is just a static subsistence activity, when you look more closely at it, I don't think that holds. There's an increase in capital intensity in this sector that's driving rising productivity, and this includes the local manufacture and maintenance of equipment. And this is the key part, really, and I suppose partly where the title for the book comes from, is that this process is disrupted when foreign corporates come onto the scene. Why is that? Foreign corporates don't really mind so much about completely manual local labor, because the productivity is very low, they're on the marginal deposits, it's not a huge threat to the value of the concessions they hold. As soon as these people start to mechanize and introduce machinery and increase their rate of productivity, that becomes a problem, right? Because suddenly they're extracting the deposits. At a... I'm gonna give you one basic example. If you're, if you're breaking down ore manually or rocks with your hands which extract gold ore, you can break maybe 10 kilograms in a day, right, using a hammer and sitting. If you just have a sim pretty relatively simple machine, you put it into a mixer, you can do 300 kilograms in half an hour. So we're talking of productivity increases. You know, if you're a mining company, you're pretty concerned by that sort of behavior. And so what happens when, they, when you see mechanization or if mechanization's present is foreign corporates will open up legal cases, they will block access to sites, and they will physically appropriate the machinery. They will send police in or send military in, get the machinery, put it on the back of trucks, and I saw this happen myself, and they will just drive it away to provincial capitals. And then this process recovers and continues in this absence. This is what I see in the book. You know, when you have Siminki and Banro, when these companies are at their peak is when all of this was at its sort of nadir, if you like, right? It was being repressed the most forcefully. When these companies sort of decline and move out is when you see and this, is what you're, this, this process starts to recover, yeah? And so again, I think, you know, one of the arguments the World Bank likes to put forward now is that this can be uh, local miners and foreign miners can, can live together in harmony, right? Because they're not interested in the same deposits. You know, the local miners are working basically like low grade marginal deposits. The corporates are working the technologically complex deposits. 
But that only holds if you conceptualize local mining as a low productivity subsistence activity, right? If you start to think of it in this way, you realize that actually over a longer time frame, they're in competition for the same deposits, right? And so it's a different way of conceptualizing it that I think leads us to quite different conclusions. Right, just to wrap up now. So what's the major argument of the book? The major argument is basically that this process of foreign corporate mining industrialization in the Congo has been reproducing similar processes of peripheral polarization, marginalization, and exclusion to those identified by these earlier lineages of structuralist and dependency thinking. I mean, not, I should, could also have put Arthur Lewis in there, who's neither of those. Um, but it's a mistake to dismiss these, you know, would be my argument. We shouldn't dismiss these earlier critiques as being anachronistic so lightly, and we should take them more seriously, and they have something to say to the current moment. But also that the constraints to mining-led development and industrialization in the Congo and other low-income African countries, and this is where I kind of make my claim to generalizability, which we can debate, right, and discuss, but I'm quite, I try to be quite specific about what is generalizable here and what isn't. But the generalizability for me is that these constraints, I'm going to list the three of them now, are structural constraints. It's not about who owns or manages mining, right? What determines developmental outcomes from mining is not necessarily, for me, the big story that was promoted within this African mining consensus, that it's about who owns and manages the mines, there are actually constraints on the developmental outcomes you can get, I think, from a mining sector in a low-income African economy that are based, one, to the concept of enclavity, basically the idea that these mining companies are like islands of high productivity, right, in sort of seeds of low or lower productivity. And so they're, they're, they're disarticulated is a word that's often used to talk about, or they're disembedded from that context, right? And so the value that's being generated tends to just disappear back overseas when it's under foreign ownership. Price volatility, which I talked about, is a, is a constraint on the sector in the sense, you know, when you saw those two examples from Eastern Congo, the way that price volatility is what determines the success or otherwise of mining companies' trajectories. It's not about if they're necessarily foreign or domestic owned. And then low levels of labor absorption. Right? When you're operating at the technological frontier of industrial mining, there are fewer and fewer people being employed by that. We now have, in East, northeastern Congo, we have fully automated under, underground gold mines where it's basically rail, railway tracks with lorries going in with no one driving them and coming out. And I would argue, or I do argue, that each of these three, const three constraints is actually felt more severely today than was the case historically, rather than less severely. And there's a literature on financialization that would speak to that for price volatility. And clarity is more severe because the productivity gap is greater, right? The distance, I mean, you look at the history of mining in Congo, that's very clear. The productivity gap now between industrial mining and the technological gap, you know, and the Congolese economy, you know, is greater today than it has been historically. And the same with labor absorption, right? Of course, the more that you increase capital intensity, you know, the less labor that you're going to need, right? So the final slide on the implications of this argument is that these three structural constraints hamper the ability of mining industrialization in Congo and low-income African countries to stimulate structural transformation or raise living standards, however you're going to construe it, right? Whether it's going to be under domestic ownership, whether it's going to be state-owned enterprises, whether foreign corporates, whether domestic firms, you have these structural constraints are at one point or another going to come into play. But nonetheless, within the confines of these constraints, right, you have mineral deposits, you have a mining sector, you need to think about how you want to manage and operate and run that mining sector. And I think a shift to more domestic forms of ownership is going to be preferable from this perspective of these economies to disruptive, disarticulated and value draining forms of foreign ownership. And the argument I make in particular is that these domestically owned efforts to mechanize labor-intensive forms of local mining are basically more appropriate for the context of a low-income African economy. What low-income African economies, you're thinking about structural transformation, right, um, or economic transformation, you need rising productivity, labor absorption, right, is, is critical and domestic retention of the value that's being generated, right? How do you retain that value? It's a huge challenge, right, for low-income economies in particular, you've got a low industrial base. How are you gonna retain the value that you're creating? And this process of sort of locally-led mining industrialization that I was talking to, you know, I think better meets these needs, yeah, and is more embedded within kind of local and national Congolese economy 
um, than the kind of foreign corporate owned industrial mining. So I suppose, you know, broadly speaking, the book is arguing for this sort of shift. Yeah? It's not saying you're never going to need highly capital intensive mining or there's no, never going to be space for foreign ownership, but it's arguing for a shift in emphasis and balance, right? Towards something that is more down on this side, more thinking about labor intensity and domestic ownership um, as crucial ways to try and better capture what developmental potential you might get from your level of um, resource extraction. Final thing, I see there's hands going up, just final, final thing. People often ask me at the, when I do these talks, well, how likely is it we're going to move to that place in the coming years? Uh, and I guess this is to end on a bit of a pessimistic note, but maybe a realistic note. This is um, Glencore and Rio Tinto, and you see this across the whole mining industry today, is they're repositioning themselves, and there is a kind of a harsh reality and truth to this as well, as central to achieving the green transition in the time frame that we need to achieve it, right? Because we need huge increases in copper, in cobalt, in all these critical metals and minerals, and who's going to do it? Who's best place to do it? It's the foreign industrial miners, right? And this is, this is when you go to mining conferences these days, this is what they're all talking about, and this is how they're all thinking. And I think this is going to make it very difficult to envisage the sort of shift, I suppose, that I'm talking about and that, let's say, Congolese miners in Eastern Congo are trying to push forward and make space for. So thanks very much. I did it in 32 minutes, so it wasn't too bad. <laughs>
you know, a lot of kind of mineral economics literature, for example, which is writing about these things, is, is just not coming from those traditions. So they're maybe not thinking about it from those perspectives, or they're not, you know, it's a certain, you know, so Prebish, for example, you've all been taught, I mean, I would say within the development study space broadly, is a pretty marginal figure. I mean, he's hugely influential for those who are within that space, but if you look at development journals across the board for the last 20 years, you know, how much has Prebish been cited and made use of? So I suppose part of my answer would be, these are pretty critical lineages that maybe a lot of people who are being trained in other spaces, development spaces, might not be exposed to or have understanding of. I guess my question is, how much of that is a lack of uh, knowledge of these arguments? How much is it a mar an intentional... Uh, Intentional in a broad kind of structural sense, I guess, marginalization of these views. I, yeah, I don't think it's intentional, like a cynical, I don't think it's sort of like people have been, you know, I don't think Kaplinsky or Morris were like, we need to just take, I mean, they did take down Prebisch, and you read their stuff, and they're, you know, they basically very explicitly say, but I, I, yeah, I suppose I don't, I don't, I'm not well enough placed to read if that was sort of what the intentionality behind that was and what their motivations were. I suppose it's their own reading. But certain people just seem to be able to get into certain spaces and have a huge amount of influence. And of course, when you've got new policy insights, I suppose, right, people want to hear that. Uh, and it feeds in, and it's not a very, com I don't know, would you want to add anything? Well, uh, we can I know. take it up at the pub. Yeah, let's do it at the pub. I mean. You have to remember neoliberalism influenced yeah. and rest. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, which really was, you know, a, a conscious, yeah. Kind of retreat or opposition to. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There, there's Tom Henry, Arthur, Pierre. <laughs> who, who else has a question? So why don't we take the, listen to the three questions? Oh, I'll, I'll listen to them all and then answer them. Yeah. yeah. Just, just because I know they're going to want to come in. They've been lying okay. outside. Six thirty though, 6 right? Six thirty. Okay. Yeah, I'll take three then and then I'll answer them. You started by saying state, um, so there's free multinational state and low intensity. Now, yeah. In the end you say locally owned. Does this, is this for your locally owned state enterprise or is it mm. uh, artisanal yeah. uh, private business but DRC private business? Yeah, good question, thank you. Yeah. Um, I would like to know your take on the, the Africa mining vision that was adopted by yeah. the African Union in 2009. Yeah. Um, because like one of the big aim and ambition was to sort of uh, break the structures that have been done before, try to make things different. But in yeah. the end, we've seen that yeah, the story, the story yeah. seems to repeat itself. Is it maybe like the reason why? Like, is it like the reason why we've seen some good outcomes, regarding as you were saying, like uh, some mechanization uh, within the other uh, ASOs or small mm -hmm. yeah. scale mining, or yeah. is it like just part of the? of that big consensus that is problematic. Yeah. Um, it's probably well, it's already anyway, but just to make sure, um, at the end you say that we might need to shift to a more labor intensive uh, and domestic uh, form of production. I was wondering, shifting to, I agree with you, but how do we make sure that then this, this labor is not completely underpaid with no security? Mm -hmm. and then also that, as you said, in a capital-intensive form of production, they don't really care about labor production because it's not really productive, it's not really yeah. a threat. So the, the question of labor, yeah. It would become a threat, and so there would be no other alternative because people would now not be able to do it on the side. No alternative to? to for example, they would have to take these underpaid jobs in the TNC because they could not do it on the side locally because that it would be seen as a threat in a uh, labor productive. Yeah. So the question is about the role of labor within a locally industrializing How sector. Labor, uh, labor production. Yeah. I would make sure that it's not labor so conditions. Yeah. Okay. I'll take them in that order. Um, I mean, the labor question, you're right, and it reminds me of. Um, there was a book published a few years ago on African economic development by uh, Kramer, Sender, and uh, Okube, I think, which is, and, and they talk about economic development as, you know, capitalist development is, I think they use the words brutal, messy, and contingent, or coerced. I mean, yeah, it's a messy process. We're talking about capitalist development. So how do you then deal with the labor issues? I suppose, at least theoretically, that's where the state comes in, right? Where the state should and could have a role. How viable is that in the Congo is a different question, but that would be my, my answer. The African mining vision, I think, yeah, that was what I mentioned briefly at the beginning. It definitely had a more 
confrontational stance with corporations and for example what the world bank envisioned it was trying to regulate more put forward local content and localization and so it was but it was still within that framework of a foreign corporate-led sector i think the major issue with the mining vision has been implementation and i think largely it's remained broadly as a policy document and its translation through to kind of national level mining strategies and influence there, I think, is a bit more difficult to trace. If you talk to people who are involved in it, that's been the major disappointment. So those outcomes of locally led mining mechanisation I'm talking about were basically just organic processes that were being led despite the presence of, you know, the state and others who were trying to suppress it. So certainly that's not the outcome of, of that policy. But nonetheless, that policy is referred to a lot today still and seen as sort of something that can be taken forward for a slightly more radical reframing and shaping. Uh, and then your question on, the uh, local yeah am i talking about local state-owned enterprises or so at the end i was talking and thinking particularly of that more local level right so the labor intensive mining but of course as that process then um continues to mechanize and industrialize right at some point then those sort of more loosely formed cooperatives or associations will probably will become firms some of them have done then become enterprises they might become nationally owned then that question of whether they're private owned Congolese firms, right, or state-owned Congolese firms, like, I don't personally come down on particularly strongly within the book, um, or kind of take a particularly strong stance on, but beyond saying domestic ownership, right, whether it, wherever that might look, but I certainly think there'd be some advantages to nationalising um, existing foreign corporate industrial mines and having those under national control. Whether you want to do that at the more local level, I think there's a different time frame to that process, you know. Um, yeah, and there was one more question. Did you did you did you want to ask it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I was just wondering um, what it means for African countries and their development that, like, the World Bank has like announced that they are no longer um, funding coal projects and they're phasing out mm -hmm. funding for oil and gas at a time like when a lot of African countries have come to find they have oil and gas reserves. Yeah. So what's going on there, as you mean? What's the, yeah, what's the... So what, like, what it means for their development and how to, like, mobilise resources for, because of, like, their environmental impacts, like, how do you mobilise resources for these industries when there are shifts, or, like, to, you know, to low carbonize. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One other question. Just one small question. Really quickly. Yeah, very quickly, because I was also writing a paper on the uh, uh, conflict minerals, and I know China has a big impact there. So I'm just curious whether, at any case, the influence of China shifted the policy and politics within this uh, mining sector. Yeah, I mean, definitely Congolese mining sector has been a huge shift to, Chine to China and to Chinese ownership. And, I mean, that mine, uh, Tengo from Garim, used to be owned by Freeport McMoran, U.S. miner. It's now a, a, under Chinese ownership. So, yeah, I mean, there's been a huge shift in Congo, both to ownership of projects and also direction of exports. And that's the geopolitics right now. You see a lot of U.S. investment coming in to try and create these new corridors through Angola uh, to secure, in particular, cobalt and other. So, yeah, there's a whole geopolitics, but for now, China is dominant, for sure. Um, and the question on, just remind me quickly, the question was, um, uh, oh yeah, oil and gas. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't uh, jump so quickly to the idea that this is being phased out. You know, I think, yeah, the World Bank maybe, but you look at, for example, Saudi Arabia and its role uh, right now in Africa um, and the investments that are taking place. Um, yeah, I think it's still very much open, op an open question as to what extent oil and gas is being phased out. Um, both at levels of production and if you look at current investments for future projects coming online, I think it's...